Hey folks, today we've got a complete beginner's guide for the DJI Mini 3 Pro. Now in this video, I'm gonna take you from start to finish, basically all the parts you got in the box, getting out, flying up in the air, the fundamentals of obstacle avoidance, and then into the video and photo modes, the vertical shooting, all the new features of the Mini 3 Pro, into the quick shots, active track. I'm gonna walk you through every single one of those pieces over the course of the next 30, 45 minutes. You can use the YouTube chapters along the bottom right there to find the section you want. If you're a little more experienced and wanna skip ahead beyond the takeoff, for example, into some of the more advanced features. Now I've got quite a bit of experience flying drones, more than a decade at this point, so I'm gonna give you tons of quick tips and practical things along the way, a uh, little tricks that I picked up, including lots of little tips and tricks on the Mini Throw in particular, because I've used it for a bit now and I've got a pretty good feel for where it works really well and where are some of the things to be aware of. Okay, so with that, let's get straight into it. Now, when you buy the DJI Mini 3 Pro, you've got basically three choices in terms of how you buy it. The first one is to buy it without a remote controller. That means you have an existing remote controller from DJI that's compatible with it, probably this one right here, or you can buy it with the base remote controller. In this remote controller, you're gonna go ahead and use your phone. It's gonna snap into the top right there, just like most past DJI remotes, and that works great. The second option you have is to go ahead and buy the new DJI RC. This is this controller right here. This has a screen built into it so you don't have to worry about taking your phone everything's kind of consolidated and just works a little more cleanly in the past i would have said not to bother buying the fancy remotes they're just way too expensive almost a thousand bucks in those cases uh, but this one again is fantastic in terms of the quality the build the practicality the ease of it i really recommend getting this note that you do have to have some sort of remote control unlike dji drones from yesteryear you know three to five years ago where you could use your phone you can't just exclusively use your phone to connect to the dji mini 3 so you will need to have some sort of dji remote control in order to fly it. The next piece is in the drone itself. You can see it right here. Uh, now it's got a battery hole in the back and then there's basically two different types of batteries depending on where you live. So you have the base battery, which has the 249 grams shown on the back of it right there. Keeping the weight under 250 grams helps in some countries to avoid registration and licensing. Check which with whatever country you're in to figure out whether that applies to you. The second battery is Intelligent Flight Battery Plus, this one right here. This has even more battery time, showing about 46 minutes of battery time with this battery versus this one. They are identical in size, identical in shape. Only difference is literally the weight. So with a heavier battery, it pushes it above the 250 gram limit, uh, basically putting a different class for certain country. And then what I'm holding right here is the battery charging case. So you see there's a little USB-C port right there, also a regular USB-C outlet to charge an initial thing like the remote control. You just simply snap the batteries into it and now you can go ahead and charge three batteries at once. Though technically they're sequentially, so it charges one battery, little LEDs on the side there, one battery, the next battery, the next battery. So it's not concurrently. Still, it's a lot better if you just want to leave it there for the night, let them charge up. It takes about an hour, an hour and a half to go ahead and charge the batteries. Otherwise, you can go ahead and put them into the aircraft and just charge it using the port in the back right there. Do ensure you don't forget to put a micro SD card in there though, because it's kind of a sad deal if you forget to do that. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and take one of these batteries right there and I'm gonna slide it into the case. It's very simple, just go ahead and do that. And I'm gonna open up the wings, slide it down like this, slide it open and swing it down, slide it open, and now you've got the aircraft all unfolded. Uh, now you're gonna go take the gimbal cover off, this piece right there, and then this is the gimbal itself. Now in a lot of ways, you wanna treat the gimbal kinda of like a flower, in the sense that it's relatively fragile, like if you were just go ahead and just use your hand and move it around a bunch, you might break it. Uh, just touching it like this is not gonna hurt it too much. You'll notice the gimbal rotates up and down, and essentially keeps the camera absolutely perfectly stable. You might see today it's a little bit windy right now, uh, thus it'll keep this thing perfect, like there's no wind whatsoever. And you'll see that as we get going. It also allows you to move the camera around uh, and to control the orientation. Now you'll note there are four propellers on it, one, two, three, four. Uh, the propellers do actually have slightly different configurations. There's two different types of propellers. Uh, and the way you can tell the difference, if you look, there's these two little markings right there, that little black marking, a little black marking, but it's not on these ones here. If you do need to replace the propellers, your kit would have included an extra set of props. You just put a little screwdriver on the top. Just make sure you put them on the correct one. Otherwise, uh, bad things will happen. It'll basically probably flip over the aircraft. It's not horrendous, uh, but it's not ideal a way to get your flight started. Next, we got the obstacle avoidance sensors. This is new on the DJI Mini 3. Back in the days, prior to the Mini series, when it was called a Spark, there was actually obstacle avoidance avoidance sensors. Now they're back again. There are two frontward facing ones, these two right here. There are two downward facing ones, these two right here. And then there is two rearward facing ones right there. Uh, the front ones and downward ones have a little bit more power in terms of range and horizontal as well as vertical viewpoints. So think of it like a giant camera. Uh, so it's not just straightforward, it's actually more like this and it's more like this. So it allows you a lot more range in terms of what it avoids. Uh, and the same is true of the backwards ones, just with a little bit narrower field of view. And then finally, there's the button to power it on. I press it once and let go and then long hold it again. You know, see it lights all the LEDs up and you might have heard of this and now watch the gimbal will go ahead and rotate around in just a second. 
there's a little boop, boop, boop saying it's alive, uh, and the gimbal will lock itself in place, and then it'll go ahead and make sure all of its self-test checks are done. This chain is true now for the remote control. I go ahead and I just see this middle button right there. I press it once to see the LED status at the top. That's my total battery. Uh, and then I can just press it again to go ahead and turn it on. Now for this video, I'm gonna use the DJI RC. There is absolutely zero difference whatsoever between the DJI RC and this controller here in terms of everything I show in the video. And in terms of things I don't show in the video, the only difference is that the DJI RC on the bottom has two function buttons that are customizable. Regular RC actually also has ones you can customize up in the top corner there. Now, if you've got the base DJI remote here, go and just pop your phone in the top there and then use a little included cable to connect it to your phone. You'll want to install the DJI app. Uh, that's an app on Android or iOS that allows you to control the controller and the drone and everything like that. At that point, you're ready to fly. Now, when it comes to choosing a takeoff spot, you want to choose somewhere that's relatively clean and free. So in this case, I'm going to put it right there. The reason I'm choosing that is that it won't go ahead and hit the grass. So if I put it over here like this, the props will hit the grass and it might stop it. Also, don't put it on any sort of metal surface like the top of a car, for example, or a sewer grate. Uh, that will go ahead and interfere with the compass inside of it and it'll probably throw an error message, but it'll also might confuse it and screw it up for later on in flight. Next, you'll see on the roll controller right now that it offers me to do a beginner tutorial, beginner flight tutorial. I'd recommend doing that. In this case, though, I'm going to skip that because I'm going to basically do it for you. Go so confirm, ignore that. And now you can see what the drone itself is showing. The very first thing I want to do, though, is to double check a couple parameters. So go ahead and choose the dot, dot, dot at the top. So this little option right up here in the corner there. Uh, and now validate that obstacle avoidance is enabled. Uh, in my case, I have it set for bypass. Break means that instead of going around something, it's just going to simply stop outright. Uh, that's something we can talk about later on. Next, if we slide on down in the options here, I always validate that the max distance and the max altitude are set. The max altitude is something that you want to validate. It's not going to go above that. In most countries, you're looking about 400 feet or about 120 meters or so. So that's what I set it for there uh, from like a regulatory standpoint. And max distance can again depend on your country. But in my case, I'm mostly doing it so if the aircraft goes somewhere it shouldn't, I know I can at least find it. So it's about 1,500 meters away. And then also you can set your automatic return to home altitude. That's the auto RTH you see right there. Return to home means that if it loses connection with the controller or something happens where uh, it can't connect to you anymore, it'll automatically return to this exact same spot. In this case, I want to do that relatively relatively high, about 100 meters. That way it's going to avoid anything along its path, and 100 meters around here means it's going to basically avoid, well, pretty much everything. Next thing you want to do, especially, absolutely, if this is your first flight with this drone, is ensure the firmware is updated. It should have prompted you by now to do this, but you tap the About button right there and go down there on your aircraft firmware and just do Check for Updates. And that'll go ahead and check and make sure there's no updates available. That's super important on DJI drones because they will be made months ago at this point, and that firmware won't even have half the features I'm talking about. Like, it literally will not have things like 4K60, all the quick shot modes, those will be missing. Uh, so you definitely want to ensure that your firmware is updated to at least the level you see right there before you get started. Finally, validate up in the corner there that you've got a full battery. So you see 96% right there. Uh, you see that the RC status has a full signal. And you see right next to that, the obstacle avoidance is enabled. There's no red. You're just basically looking for no red in the top of your controller. Uh, you see I've got 30 satellites available right now, which is incredible. And then when I first power it on, it'll say home point updated. The home point has has been updated. Once it has about 12 satellites, do not take off before it says home point updated or that has all of its satellites. If you do, it will not be able to find its way back to here. And additionally, if you take off before all the satellites, it won't necessarily be very stable in flight. With that, let's go ahead and just simply take off. Uh, now, there's two ways to do this. One, we can press this button that's located right here. Uh, let's see if you can see it right there. This will go ahead and it'll say take off. Just simply hold this for a couple seconds. It'll spin up the props and it'll automatically take itself up up to about two meters, meter and a half or so. And now you'll see it's gonna go ahead and stay put there once it gets in the air. It's using its ground sensors, basically pointing downwards to the ground to maintain its exact position in concert with the GPS side of things. Uh, I usually press record at this point, so I don't forget to do that later on. In fact, I usually try to do it when I get on the ground right there. And what's notable is that while the aircraft is kind of tilting at the side because of the wind right here, the actual image that you see in this is perfectly flat. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the aircraft up in the air high. I usually like to get up in the air and out of the way pretty quickly. To do that, I just use the left controller and go up like this. This gets it up like that. And then I can go ahead and rotate it left and right, rotate the camera basically about its axis by turning like this. You can see it just rotates the camera, the entire aircraft to the right. Now, in the case of a drone like this, you're rotating the entire aircraft. So you aren't actually just changing the camera angle. So you can see it goes all the way around. And then I can go ahead now and go up again like this. And then go down by going down. And then I can change left and right and go to the left by pressing my stick over here. This now puts me over the water to the left. And then I can go the exact same way like this. 
the other direction. And now I can go forward by pressing the sticks forward like this. And then again, back like this. Now, one of the things I should have checked before I got in the air is that I'm actually in the correct mode. Uh, so you see there's three mode selectors at the top here, C, N, and S. C is cinematic mode. That basically just slows everything down in terms of the moves. It makes it theoretically more cinematic. Uh, it, again, it just slows everything down. That's all it really does. Uh, and then N is normal mode and S is sport mode. Be aware in sport mode though, it turns off all of the obstacle avoidance sensors. It allows you to lot, fly a lot faster, uh, more angular, things like that. But uh, I wouldn't recommend it unless you really know what you're doing. I will show at the end of the video though. Now it's super important to note a couple of safety options here. Uh, the first one is this button right there. This has two features to it. One is to pause whatever you're doing. So if you're doing an automatic flight shot or something like that, uh, you can just press that button to instantly pause it. But you can also always take your hands off the controllers. So if I'm flying like this, I'm going somewhere and I'm just concerned I'm gonna hit these trees, just let go. Just literally let go and it instantly stops what it's doing. So again, let's say I'm going down and backwards and I'm like, oh no, I'm gonna hit the water. Just let go and it stops. The next option is to long hold this button right here with the H on it and that'll return it to home. You see it's automatically gonna go and fly back to its return home location and you see it's automatically going back. You can cancel that at any point in time by pressing the X right there uh, and you can see now it's gonna go ahead and go down to its exact spot that it took off at. But when I say I want to cancel that, you just press this button and it pauses. And the reason I want to do that is because if you look, it's pretty close to landing in the bushes and almost the water there. So the return home location is generally pretty close, but not precisely there. So this particular takeoff location, it wouldn't have been like ideal for a beginner. Um, I might want to put it somewhere else that I have more flexibility in case it has to RTH without me necessarily present. Next, while we're here at the very bottom, you see the map right there. Now in my case, I don't have any connectivity for this controller from a cellular standpoint or a Wi-Fi standpoint. I could hotspot this controller to a Wi-Fi access point on my phone, but I'm not doing that right here. Uh, if I tap this though, it'll go ahead and expand it out. There we go. And I can see the tracks of where I am. And normally I can see a map right there. If you're on your phone using the remote controller with your phone, then you'll see a live map of this updated. I can go tap that window at the bottom and get back to this. And I can go ahead and remove this all the way down out of the way by pressing the very bottom left hand option there. So now I'm gonna fly this out of the way. I got some people coming up here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it and then get it wow over that field over there. Simple as that. Now, in a lot of ways, treat a drone kind of like you would a camera in a locker room or a bathroom, in the sense that be aware that people might be afraid of the drone. So in my case, anytime I'm near people, I'm gonna move it far away. Uh, these people here are clearly curious about it. They're looking it up, they're checking it out, they might even ask me about it, but I don't want it anywhere near them, both from a regulatory standpoint, as well as just from like a general being a good human perspective. Okay, now before we get into all the video and photo modes, one of the most important things to understand about this drone, as well as any drone, is how it's gonna handle obstacles. So I'm gonna bring it back down here real quick, and there's a tree over here and I'm gonna go run into that tree. And here is a tree. So I'm gonna bring it down pretty low into the tree. In fact, I'm gonna turn my little camera right here so you can see what's going on. And there we go. I'm gonna position it right in front of the tree, moving the gimbal up. We'll talk about the gimbal in just a second. Uh, now you can see right away, it shows at the very bottom of the screen, downward 3.2 meters, meaning the ground is within 3.2 meters of the bottom. Now, as I creep forward right here, I'm just gonna point it at this. I'm gonna creep forward and you're gonna see that it's gonna show me information, you can hear it beeping, and it's starting to go up automatically. I'm not doing anything. Let me show you this again with the hands on the controllers. So right here, I'm gonna back up, there we go. I'm gonna go down, so I'm equal to the tree itself. I'm gonna go right, so the tree is taking up my entire frame right now, right? And I'm gonna go and rotate forward on the controllers. You see it's automatically going up and over it. That is called APAS, or the Advanced Pilot Automation System, or Automated Pilot Advanced System. It's basically DJI's automatic uh, obstacle avoidance system that goes around objects. Now there are two different levels of that on the Mini 3, and it's important to understand the difference. So I'm gonna bring this back real quick again here and show you the difference. So in this case, if you notice at the very bottom, those of you that are kind of paying really close attention, I'm gonna go a little bit further back here, that my frame rate down there is 4K24. I'm gonna stop my recording real quick and I'm gonna change the frame rate to 4K60. So I just swipe on the bottom there, there we go. Again, we'll cover this portion in just a second. And now I'm gonna start recording again. Now in this case, I'm above 4K30, the key being the 30 frames per second. So when I go forward, watch what's gonna happen. It'll go forward and then it'll stop. You hear its errors or its uh, warnings, the red on the screen there indicating that it's got an obstacle in front of it uh, and it's upset, it's beeping a bunch and you can say it's, at this point it's not gonna go any further forward. The core difference between that and what I just showed you a moment ago is with APAS in below 4K30, 4K30 and below, it will actually go around or above the obstacle. 
but not in the case of 4K60 or the higher frame rates, it just simply stops. Now to demonstrate there's rearward facing sensors, I can go ahead and rotate this aircraft around. So we're gonna rotate 180 degrees. Now it's basically looking forward and the tree is behind it. I'm gonna go back into the tree again, just controlling straight back and you hear it beeping. And now it's showing the red at the bottom there, indicating there's something behind it and it won't fly into it. The key thing to understand with this drone is there are two scenarios where it will fly into something being from the side and up from the top, meaning that in this case, there are no sideways obstacle avoidance sensors. So if I were to turn the drone like this and go ahead and rotate and fly straight into the side, it will do that. It'll fly straight in that tree and it'll crash. Will it break? Probably not. It's just gonna go hit the tree and land well in the, in the little canal water thing there. But if any other portion of the tree, it, it wouldn't necessarily die. Um, the other thing to be aware of though is going up into something. That's where you're probably gonna kill your drone is if you're flying below trees and go up into the tree because there is no optical avoidance sensor on the top. However, what DJI does here is something clever with that front optical avoidance sensor. It's got a really wide field of view like this. So it can generally see things upwards at an angle. So when it goes around that tree over the top of it, it knows that's clear because it's looking above at this high angle. I'm gonna go back to 4K30, which takes us right into the video mode section of this flight. So there we go, back to 4K30. I'm just gonna back this up here, take it away from the tree so I don't have to listen to that thing anymore and we'll look at this pretty little boat coming through here. So at this point, you can go ahead and tap that little film strip icon in the upper right-hand corner right there, uh, and now you'll see there's a couple different options. One, there's normal and slow mode, and then you have photo, master shots, etc. We're gonna start off in normal mode right there, uh, and then if you look at the bottom, I see I have the res and FPS down at the very bottom right there. As I change my resolution, you can see 2.7K, I get additional frame rates up to 60 frames. At 1080p, I also get 60 frames. You're wondering why aren't the 120 frames per second there? That's because again, those are back under the slow-mo options. So the top there, tap slow-mo under uh, video. And now I see these options down here for 180p at 120 frames per second. Uh, and then again, if I can go back to normal mode there, I can go back into 4K at the high resolution, which I prefer to keep it in. Generally speaking, when it comes to video and resolutions, you should shoot the higher the better, uh, even if you're not gonna necessarily use that. Uh, in terms of frame rates though, the reason you might want to max out at 30 frames per second on this drone is it'll shoot HDR video at 30 frames per second. Also, as you saw, you have more flexibility for obstacle avoidance. When it comes to things like active track, that's only limited to 30 frames per second. So I'm going to generally shoot 30 frames per second unless I have a reason to go to 60 frames per second. The reason is being you might want to slow something down. If I want something to maybe look a little more cinematic, I can take 60 frames per second and then slow that down in post-production to basically be twice as slow or even three times as slow. So to start recording, I just press that record button right there there uh, and that allows me to record. Now we have a couple of actual physical buttons on the controller that are useful for video modes. The first one is the gimbal control up here, this little wheel that you see right there. Now when I move this wheel, it's going to rotate the gimbal down like this, all the way down to 90 degrees straight down, or most interestingly, all the way up to 60 degrees up. This means you can, in this case, literally see the sun as it were, um, or you can go ahead and look upwards at a tree. I mean, some incredibly cool angle options there. Bring it on down right here though. Uh, and the next option is to zoom. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn, rotate the entire aircraft towards the windmill right there. I'm gonna get it in the center of my frame a little bit. Uh, and now the zoom option is this wheel over here. So if I just go ahead and rotate this wheel forward, you'll see it'll zoom on in there. And you can see that zoom at one point, so all the way up to two X. I can also just simply tap that on the right hand side back to one and two X. The thing to understand is that when you zoom on this drone or really any drone, it's reducing the overall resolution, basically just cropping in. That's all it's doing. So at this point, when I'm fully zoomed in here, it's equivalent to about a 1080p picture as opposed to the 4K picture. And this can be useful when you don't want to deal with doing this after the fact, like for example, something quickly going up onto social media. But in general, again, just shoot at 4K and crop after the fact. So you can go ahead and play with that if you want to in post-production as opposed to doing it on the controller itself. Now let's say this windmill is a little bit too uh, dark, which it is. I can tap on this and then tap on that little sun and then go up like this and increases exposure to the frame, obviously way overexposed now, or down to the bottom and be way underexposed like that or back to the middle. I can also increase the exposure um, down the bottom by choosing the EV. So that's that little option at the very bottom right hand corner there. Uh, and now I can tap this and I can say up a third of a stop, for example, uh, or a seventh and so on. Now, in addition to changing the resolutions, you can also change the recording file formats. So in the top right hand button there, choose a little dot, dot, dot. 
and then you go into camera and you see a format MPV or MOV, uh, color normal or D cine like, and then the recoding format 264 or 265. In general, you're gonna to wanna to shoot in 265 unless you've got a really old computer that maybe doesn't support that, uh, but you're gonna get basically smaller file sizes in 265, uh, and it's gonna be more efficient. You can get more stuff on the drone from a storage standpoint. From a color perspective, I'm gonna choose normal the vast majority of the time. That means I don't want to do post-production of this video file. If you look right now, so let me just point away from the sun because we're kind of shooting towards the sun a little bit. Uh, get something, there we go. Some clouds there. This there we go. Cows and a barn and everything. Looks great, right? Looks nice and pretty. I'm going to show you now, if I change it to D-Cine-like, this will remove all the color from this, but it allows me to go ahead and grade it in post-production. Uh, so if you're familiar with color grading in post-production, great, you may love this. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't do this. It's just gonna add a lot of time and effort, and I don't ever do this. Like, I will very rarely do this if I got some majestic, incredible, once-in-a-lifetime shot that I wanna grade it afterwards, and I'm only gonna do that after I've already shot it in normal mode, because more than likely, DJI is gonna do a better job of getting that color right than I am. Uh, so again, here's what it looks like if you're looking a full res version of this uh, and then here is what it looks like if I go back and change over to the normal mode. Now one quick thing to note here is that all the stuff that you're seeing on the screen recording is a screen recording at a lower resolution. Uh, so in the case of the DJI RC it has a screen on itself of 1080p but the screen recording is actually a little bit lower than that so it's going to look a little bit pixelated and blocky to you. Uh, to me on the screen it looks really nice and sharp but the screen recording that it does is lower than that and of course the actual camera recording of the camera itself is 4k which is roughly about four times the resolution of 1080p. Okay, so now just to kind of show some basic moves here, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna rotate this way. I'm gonna go up a little bit of altitude just so we got a little more perspective. I'm gonna go towards our windmill right there. Uh, and now I'm gonna go forward. So I'm gonna push the stick forward and I'm gonna go ahead and then rotate the gimbal down as I do that. Uh, so again, slowly doing that. A little bit too fast because my timing wouldn't have had me arrive at the windmill on time. Uh, but again, you see the point here being to go ahead and do this. I can now go the other direction. So now I'm kind of going ahead and opening up and you see the windmill as I arrive at it. Uh, so kind of cinematic there if you wanted to. Uh, and now we're closer to the windmill itself. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, there's a couple of custom buttons that you can set. These are particularly useful for the video and photo modes. So if you choose the top uh, dot, dot, dot at the top there, you go to control, you go on down here, you see button customization, C1 and C2. You have recenter gimbal and follow and FPV. So I can choose what to do for one of these things. I can go ahead and say, this will increase the EV or decrease the EV. I can reset the gimbal. I can go into hyperlapse mode. Uh, these are useful if you just want to quick action things. Uh, resetting the gimbal is a good example of that. So to show what that looks like now, is I've got this uh, custom mode, custom one at the bottom. I'm first going to put the gimbal straight down at some wonky angle, 58 degrees, you can see there. And I just press the C1 and boom, it's straight back to level again. So now seems like a good time to talk about the photo modes. So I'm gonna put this down a little bit so just a prettier uh, picture to look at. I'm gonna stop my recording and I'm gonna change over to the photo modes. So you see that film strip icon right there? I then choose that and choose photo. And now I have more photo options. I've got single, 48 megapixel, AEB, burst, and time shot. Uh, I can take a single picture just by pressing that little single button like that, and boom, it takes a picture. See, it takes a couple seconds to do that. I can then press this again, go to 48 megapixel. You'll notice it looks darker at first. Uh, it actually turns out the fine, the same. It turns out great after the fact. And once you press this button, and it changes that and does a 48 megapixel photo. At the very bottom, you'll see that it says the number of photos remaining, 11,000 or 1,164, as well as the format. If I tap on that right now, I've got JPEG or JPEG plus RAW. For me as a photographer, I'm always gonna shoot both, just because I just wanna have the flexibility of a raw photo after the fact. Uh, if you don't care about that, you can choose JPEG, but again, I would really always choose uh, both if you want to. You then have the exposure options, and then you also have where it says auto, you can go ahead and change all of those photo settings right there. So the shutter speed, the f-stop, uh, your white balance, ISO, et cetera. I can tap on any one of those things and go ahead and tweak them. So as soon as I do this, it goes and changes the scenes. I can change my ISO. Uh, obviously this is looking like crap at this point, but uh, just to show you what you could do, or you can go ahead and on the left-hand side there, uh, you can change your white balance. So you can uh, rotate and turn it off of auto, and then you can go up and down. Obviously it's not gonna look super ideal. You can go back to the normal mode by pressing the pro option there at the bottom and going back into auto. You can see it looks a little bit darker there, a little darker than I probably prefer. I'm expose down towards the bottom, uh, so it's a little more clean. Now back into the photo options, uh, you see there's auto exposure bracket or AEB. Basically you can take a series of photos one after another, either three photos or five photos that are underexposed uh, right in the middle and then overexposed and to combine those together. If I do this right there, it takes those, 
Go ahead and you see a processing, basically teeth taking three photos in a row. And all these photos are on the SD card after the fact if you want to do your own combining and processing yourself. Again, tapping that, uh, you can do burst. You can take three, five, or seven photos. Not a ton of photos, but you know, if you're trying to catch some sort of uh, quick moving thing, it might be useful, but that's pretty low in the grand scheme of burst photography. And then there's time shot. Time shot is gonna go ahead and do this on a preset interval. So all the way down from two seconds, all the way up to 60 seconds. Uh, this is actually super duper useful. One of my favorite modes when I wanna capture action of myself or a group of people without the controller in the view, uh, primarily from a photo standpoint. So I may take the two second photo like that, go ahead and press this, then put the controller behind my back, picture in the sky, great, it's good to go. Same sort of thing, if your regulations allow in your area to put the controller on the ground, uh, do whatever move you wanna do, you can do that. We'll go back up to this photo option, and then we'll go down all the way to Pano. These are also photo modes there, but not under the photo section. You've got sphere, 180 degrees, wide angle, or vertical. So if I do the wide angle right now, what it's gonna do is a series of photos. So I'm gonna press this button, uh, and you'll see it'll move the camera automatically, and it's gonna do this on the right-hand side, you see the percentage there, so 16%, 22%, and so on. And it's gonna take this whole set of photos at high resolution and stitch it together into a giant high-res photo. Uh, now, this works reasonably well on a day like this where it's relatively sunny, there's not a lot of movement, there's no clouds up there. Uh, if it was a windier day than this and there was a lot of clouds, you can see now it's actually doing the stitching itself, then it may not be as great because those things are gonna overlap and be kind of weird. The same if there's a train over there coming through and it takes photos in different spots, it might look pretty weird as well. So you can see there's that train just uh, passing off in the distance, wouldn't be as ideal there. Now let's get into one of the coolest features of the Mini 3, uh, which is the ability to have vertical video and vertical photos. Now of course, there will be some purists that are like, vertical video is horrible, and that's cool. But the reality is that if you're on Instagram with a platform, it's like a social media standpoint, you're probably shooting and are using a lot of vertical video. video. So on the Mini 3, the entire gimbal can rotate itself. So you see that little option above the 1X near the record button? That'll rotate the whole gimbal. So boom, it just rotated the gimbal. And this is what it looks like in front of the camera. You can see the whole thing rotate up. Now I can recenter my frame there. I can still use the 1X and 2X, and I can record just like normal. Uh, most of the things work in the video mode, but not everything. For example, the actor track function does not work in this mode. So you don't quite have everything. It does sound like from what DJI is saying, their goal is that everything will eventually work in the vertical mode. Uh, and you can use this for photos as well as video. So again, I can go now into the photo mode here, go to photo and do the exact same thing. Uh, go to single photo, I don't need a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and there we go, I've taken that single photo and it's good to go. Uh, now the main benefit to shooting vertical versus horizontal is that if you plan to use it in vertical, which I know sounds obvious, but if I'm going ahead and taking a landscape photo and cropping it into vertical, I'm losing a lot of context of that photo. In this case, I know it's relatively similar to the aspect ratio that I'm going to upload to Instagram or any other social media platform. Or simply just using it as like a portrait. Like that's just a, this is probably a better portrait just shot if I were to bring this in a little bit closer like this, uh, down like that. It's just a prettier shot in vertical than it would be horizontal. Now I'm gonna go ahead and rotate this back here for the next bit. I'm gonna pull it back a little bit more like this. I'm gonna take it off of the 2X. Now let's talk about some of the automatic modes. So right now I'm gonna go ahead and just simply tap this window. I'll make a circle around it and I'll tap it, like a sorry, square around it. And you see it brings up this menu at the bottom. So I just use my finger to draw that around there. I would show you that on this camera right here, but my battery's now died on this, so that's kaput. And I've got three options at the bottom. Active track, spotlight, or POI. Uh, so active track is when it's gonna actively follow you somewhere. We're gonna get to that in just a second. Spotlight is essentially the same thing. It's gonna keep the camera locked on something, but you're gonna fly it around. So if a boat comes by here, I could go ahead and lock it on that, but I wanna fly it around and get different angles. Uh, so if we do this right now, I'm gonna choose Spotlight. There we go. Now at this point, it's gonna lock it on this. So if I choose my right uh, joystick, it's gonna automatically rotate around that windmill, or at least what's somewhere near the windmill. You see right there, it kind of moved away from the windmill a little. That little marker is not on the windmill anymore, meaning it's not quite perfectly centered anymore. That can happen occasionally where the object recognition isn't quite right. Go ahead and just cancel that, and then circle the windmill again. You might wanna choose a smaller section of it, so that might be too big. So really just kind of narrow down on this little piece right there. See if it finds it, there we go. And again, now if I just rotate to the right, it's gonna go ahead and keep it exactly centered in the frame. I can also increase altitude, so all my same controls are still available to me. So I can go ahead and increase the altitude like this. Uh, I can go ahead and move back further away by just pulling back on the stick. 
Now it's gonna go kind of zoom out from it. And now sometimes it moves away from the object if I get too far away. Like I can't recognize it exactly perfectly anymore. Again, you gotta kind of play with this. I'm pretty far at this point from that object, at least a couple hundred meters away, just to keep away from the people that are there. Uh, and again, it looks a beautiful shot, and I'm not doing any fancy flying. I'm literally just holding the stick like this, and it's going around the windmill and keeping it relatively centered. But I can accomplish a lot of those same things using POIs instead. I'm gonna move forward again, a little bit closer to this windmill. I'm gonna put my gimbal down. You can change the gimbal, by the way, as you do this. There we go. I'm gonna highlight the windmill again. See if it locks back on, perfect. Now I'm gonna choose POI and I'm gonna choose go. And now it's gonna just go ahead and rotate around to the direction that I set. So in this case, I'm gonna rotate faster this way. And you can see now it's going a little bit faster because I'm so far away from it, it's gonna feel slow at this point. But you can see that it's uh, doing that. I can then change a the direction, the other direction if I want to. And you'll see I'll stop here and it'll rotate the other way like this. And again, if I was much closer, it would do this faster. So let's go back to me, just so you can see what this looks like. I gotta press the little X on that up there. Now I'm gonna purposely keep the aircraft above any trees nearby. So if I just look out here, I'm not gonna hit those trees if I go sideways, or I'm not gonna hit these trees over there if I go sideways. And the reason is, remember, there's no side obstacle void in sensors. So if I were to go ahead and uh, go sideways and do the POI and rotation stuff, and there's a tree to the side of me, it's gonna run right into it. Okay, POI and go. And now it's gonna rotate around me, and now I can speed up, and you can see it'll move a lot faster now because it's pretty close to me. Uh, and I can see this aircraft above me, I can see it's well above any trees in this rotation here, because again, there's no side obstacle avoidance, and it would happily smash into something and we'd be out of drone. And I can then rotate the other direction if I want to by just swinging that around. And at this point it says low battery, RTH. So when it reaches 20%, it's gonna automatically return to home unless I cancel it. So it's gonna go ahead and start the return to home process. I can cancel that though by just pressing this little button right there and it'll cancel that. What I'm gonna do now though is land this one time quickly and then we'll switch off and do the active track. So let me show you how landing works. I'm gonna go forward and I'm gonna bring it myself down close to me. I always prefer to land facing myself. I just kind of like my thing in life. I don't know, I just do. Now when it gets really upset like this, so I've got my camera up so you can see the landing here since my other camera's dead. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and move it over a little bit. Try to do this, there we go, like this. And I'm gonna slowly bring it down by just pressing the down arrow. Now you can see right now it'll land on the bushes, which isn't ideal. Go over a little more like that. And now I press the little uh, land icon there, home icon, hold this down, and it'll go straight down and land automatically. In this case, it's gonna land on the grass. It's probably gonna stop the props, it's probably gonna be slightly upset about that, but it's no big deal. These props are fine to land in the grass like that. And you can see, there we go. Boom, made a little upset sound as it hit that, and now we're landed. So let me just swap the battery out real quick and we'll get back up in the air again. Now we've got a couple areas left. We've got quick shots, we've got master shots, and act track. And I'm actually gonna act track to me on this. It'll be lots of fun, uh, so stay tuned for that. So starting off with quick shots. I then press the little film strip icon again, and I go down to quick shots. Quick shots are exactly what they imply. There are quick little shots. You see Droney right there in the illustration of what it's doing. Uh, rocket, circle, helix, boomerang, asteroid is new for the uh, Mini 3. In the past, the Mini series actually had quick shots, but no obstacle avoidance. So you still have to be very careful in what you're doing, but at least there's a little bit of a safeguard there. So in this case, you'll see it automatically recognized me. I uh, see the little plus right there. I tap that. Uh, and you can then tell the distance you want it to go. Uh, let me tap that at the bottom there, rotate along. We'll choose that, and then we just choose start. Now normally you start this a lot closer than this, but let me just show you what it's gonna do. Now it's gonna go ahead and fly away from me. Uh, now this is where if you were going ahead and you had, uh, for example, like some epic sunset behind you or epic scene, you would go ahead and probably put the controller out of view so you don't see that. And you have that countdown at the very beginning there to do that. You can always press the pause button up on the controller itself or the stop button on the display there and that'll stop that. After this is done, it'll return to home. Again, the main thing to be aware of with all these quick shot modes, especially the ones that rotate around you, is there's no side obstacle avoidance sensors. So these modes are here with the assumption that you are paying attention to what you're doing. For a drone like this, because it has the backwards obstacle avoidance sensors, it's a relatively safe move to do. Uh, but as I go ahead and look at the other ones here, let me just show you like the Helix, for example, where it rotates and goes upwards in a spiral. Uh, that's something you gotta be a little more careful with. There we go, we're back. I'm now gonna choose a different one. I'm gonna choose the Helix, and you can see it's gonna kind of rotate around. I'm gonna get a little bit closer to me, but again, above all the trees that are nearby, I then tap myself. I can choose which direction to, to go in. So there we go, tap myself. Uh, the maximum radiance, again, obstacle avoidance, be aware of that, and then start, and it's gonna go ahead and get that countdown. This is where I might hide the controller and be like, yo, no controller here, it's all good. 
And you can see it's gonna start to rotate around me and I'll just give you the kind of quick little version of what this looks like as it uh, goes ahead and finishes it up. Now quick shots are great for just getting one off quick shots like that. It takes about a minute or so to finish. Uh, but if you want like a whole pile of options or a whole pile of shots, you choose master shots here. Uh, and it is probably one of the coolest features out there, even for like pro drone folks. Uh, and the main reason why is master shots give you a two to three minute B-roll extravaganza. It basically takes all of those quick shots and a few other things and just does them one thing after another and gives you this two to three minute just raw B-roll file, or it gives you an edited little short video depending on what video length you want. So to do that, we're gonna go over to the windmill because that's like the place to do this. So let me get, find the windmill over there. So I'm gonna draw an object around this, or sorry, a square around this. So now that's the object, the estimated flight time for how long. So do I want the medium width, medium length, medium height, uh, how high do I wanna go, etc. So I can change that to be small or high. Uh, we're gonna medium height, there we go. Uh, and then the estimated length. So if I were to choose a medium or long length, sorry, you'll see it'll increase the flight duration because it's got to fly further. So now 220. And I'm going to press start. Three, two, Move my map out of the way. One. And now again, watch for surrounding obstacles. Now it's just going to go through all these. I'm going to stop this because I forgot one thing. I just remembered I did not change my resolution up to 4K. Don't want no garbage there. Now I'm going to choose start right there and ready to go. One. Now, one way you make three minutes here, so I'm gonna speed this whole thing up and you can kind of watch what it's gonna do. So the first one right there is the drony that it's doing. And it's gonna show you each one of these shots one after another. Now, when it's done with its master shots, it's gonna give you basically two things. The first is this two and a half minute long file. This is just all those shots strung together. This is full resolution and awesome if you wanna take this and put it in some sort of other projects, just kind of cut up the pieces that you want. But if you tap on this, then it'll open up. And in the bottom right hand corner, you see that little magic wand? This allows you to create a quick master shots edit. So you can choose some templates here. There's a bunch of them. They all have different times of them. And then within those different templates, they have music associated with them, as well as kind of different cut sequences and effects. So for fun, here is one of the ones that you can choose. This is the 20 second or so edit, including it's all music, completely done by Master Shots, right to you. Next up, we've got hyperlapse. Now, hyperlapse is essentially a way to go ahead and create a time lapse, but in the sky. The main difference between time lapse and hyperlapse is that you're moving somewhere with the hyperlapse. So I'm gonna choose that option in the menu there, again, the film option, then down to hyperlapse. And then on the side, you've got a couple core different options. You've got free, circle, course lock, or waypoint. You probably won't use free because that means you have to manually move the controls, which will not generally come with a good result. Uh, then you've got circle, which means you're gonna rotate around an object like the windmill there. You've got course lock, which means it's gonna go ahead and keep the same heading. That's a really useful one. And then you've got waypoints. In the case of waypoints, I can set individual waypoints, for example, following the curve of the river right here, and it'll go ahead and follow that over the course of a given set period of time. So I'm gonna choose uh, lock course to begin with, because I actually prefer that one. I'm gonna go back a little bit further here first, just manually controlling it. There we go. And then I can go ahead and I can lock my direction. So I just tap that. Now the direction is locked. I can set how often to take the photo. In this case, I can set a two second interval. I can set the length. This is how long I want my entire hyperlapse to be at the end of it. So in this case, a five second long hyperlapse because it's shooting 125 frames. Uh, and it'll take me four minutes to do that, four minutes and 10 seconds. And then I can choose the speed of how long I want or how fast I want the aircraft to move. So I can choose this one right here, five uh, kilometers, six kilometers an hour. And then I go ahead and I press the record button and off it goes. And you can see it's gonna go ahead and move itself along, showing the number of frames as it takes each individual frame. And at the end of this entire thing, I've got a hyperlapse that costs a given section of time. In this case, I've got three minutes and 56 seconds remaining for this particular hyperlapse to finish. I can add time to it though at the bottom. You see that plus one S? This means to add one second of final video time. So previously I had a five second long video by the time it completes. If I press the one S button right there, you'll see it'll add, uh, 50 seconds worth of shooting duration to it to get that one extra frame per second of final video time. Now in this case, as exciting as this particular hyperlapse will be, it's not that exciting because there's not much movement in this scene. It's basically just a slow moving frame. Again, if I had clouds moving or boats or all sorts of cool stuff, it would be really cool. So as a better example of this, here's a hyperlapse I took uh, last week. Admittedly, I don't have any great hyperlapses here, but you can see how the boats are moving quickly. Also notice the traffic in the upper corner there. Again, as the camera moves along, the traffic just flies past. It's worthwhile noting at the bottom though, before I get away from this, that I can change the settings. So see where it says 4K raw? 
That basically means that one, it's gonna shoot it in 4K, the end resultant video that it's gonna output, and then two, it's gonna give me the original photos that it goes and takes to make that uh, hyperlapse. So you see at the bottom, my original option is off, don't make any photos at all two to do JPEGs or three to do RAW. If you're really into photography and you wanna go ahead and take all of those photos which are much, much higher resolution than 4K, this is super useful because now you can go ahead and do zooms and stuff like that after the fact at a much higher resolution. Again, more advanced features that you can do. In my case, I just have the backup there. I'm almost always gonna just use the exported 4K file as a video and not necessarily worry about the photos. But if I do wanna do something, that's kinda of cool to have that option. And it's time to do some actor track. Now this will be a very basic actor track example I've got an entire actor track video up in the corner up here somewhere uh, that you can go ahead and check it all out. Now, the first time you do actor track, I recommend like starting the football field and walking in circles. Don't, don't try doing it on a moving platform. Uh, don't try doing it with trees around. Uh, but the main thing to remember is just like, again, I cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, if you fly sideways, it's gonna fly sideways into these trees. So in my case, I'm gonna keep it just actually above the tree line here. So in case there's any errors at worst, uh, it'll just fly above it. So now I'm behind me right now. There we go, just like this. Uh, and I've got this photo mode out of the way. All I do is simply highlight myself. But first I'm gonna get this bike. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight myself, just like this. And you can see when I do that, it gives me the actor track option. Uh, so when I tap that, I've got two options, trace or parallel. Trace means to follow me from behind. Parallel means to be at my side. Again, parallel is kind of dangerous unless you have nothing around you. In this case, I could get away with parallel if I've got it above these trees right here. But it's really best for like the desert or beach. Uh, for example, here's a beach shot of me running on the beach. I did that in parallel because it's not gonna run anything. There's no problems there as long as it stays a certain height. I'm gonna go ahead and tap myself again, choose actor track, choose go, and now it's gonna hang out behind me. And it's as simple as that. I can just pedal along like this and you'll see it'll automatically follow me as we go down this path. Pretty cool, right? I can speed up, have no problems keeping up with me on the bike at this point. Uh, and it's using the obstacle avoidance sensors in case it sees something. There we go, pretty scenic stuff. This is super useful for following someone else as well as just following yourself doing this. Uh, you can actually buy bike mounts and things like that for controllers. I have one for the regular controller. Hopefully they'll soon be available. Uh, one for the uh, smart controller here, or sorry, the uh, DJI controller, DJI RC, the official name of it. So and I can keep on going all the way down this path if I wanted to, but I wanna show you what happens when I turn around because it's really something you need to be aware of if you're flying. So in this case, I'm gonna turn around right here. There we go. And then watch what it's gonna do. It's gonna slowly kind of back up there. Uh, now when you see when it backs up, you wanna be aware of what it's doing because it's also gonna do a little bit sideways. Backing up isn't a huge deal per se. Just gonna give it a second. It's keeping me tracked and it's gonna eventually rotate out to the side once it finds its spot here. See if it'll do it, come on. Maybe, usually it does rotate out to the side. It's got me tracked. And so at this point, it's a little bit risky in the sense that if I was closer to trees or something like that, uh, it might not go ahead uh, and avoid those trees. You can see now it's totally the side of me, no problems because there's no trees in the way. It's still tracking me, hasn't lost me yet. And now it's starting to pull its way back behind me. So it creates this kind of like J turn, if you will, behind me, and then it's good to go again. And this is where you really want to kind of understand how the drone flies. And I have many years of understanding actor track and what it is or isn't going to do. Uh, and so I can kind of predict these sort of things. But it's that churn where if you're not comfortable with it, you might want to stop uh, before it goes ahead and makes that churn. We can go all the way down this direction now here. No problems at all. Now I'm going to show you parallel mode real quick. So again, I'm going to highlight myself right there. See if it finds me. Perfect. I'm going to choose actor track. I'm going to choose parallel. I'm going to choose go. Subject is too far away, so fly a little bit closer. Again, active track, parallel, go. There we go, it seems reasonably happy about that now. And now we'll get going here. And it should say just this side of me. I'm pretty confident right now there's nothing in the river, plus I can see what it's about to fly into. I'm above all these trees, and now I've got this kind of nice sideways shot there. Uh, you can see it does kind of stop and go a little bit as it tries to figure out things. Things are in the way, like these little uh, reeds and whatnot but it's a pretty cool shot like this. And again, uh, if I was more confident in the area, I can go even lower if I wanted to, so I can bring this down like this, again, right on the river itself, and get a really cool kind of profile shot uh, as I go past the trees. 
or sorry, past everything. And this is an awesome shot to get. Again, you have to really trust what you're doing though and know that it's not gonna fly into anything. In this case, I'm over a river. There's really nothing to fly into except those trees right there, the reeds, but it's got the obstacle avoidance sensors on the front to avoid that. I'm gonna go and press stop. So I press that pause button because it's not necessarily seeing these small reeds right there, uh, these kind of twigs and stuff, if you will. So I'm gonna bring that up and now I'm clear of this and ready to roll. Okay, we're gonna get back to our starting point right now and uh, go from there. So I'm just gonna go on kind of full speed here, full send if you will, doing about 26K right now, cruising along. I actually kind of like the framing that it shows right now. It does generally keep the, it does generally go ahead and uh, rotate to the center point, but, oh, by the way, some of you are probably wondering right now what the heck it is that I'm riding in. This is a cargo bike. Uh, here in the Netherlands, this is super common. In fact, incredibly common. This particular model is called the Urban Arrow, uh, but it basically allows me to carry my whole family, three kids, a dog. My wife and I can all fit in this one bike if we want to uh, and go anywhere we want in town. It's, it's a blast. Oop, this is us. The only thing I have remaining right now is sport mode. So to choose into sport mode, to go into sport mode, I go ahead and move my selector right there from N over to S. In this mode, I no longer have any sort of obstacle avoidance. Uh, I can go ahead and get up out of the way here, just so I'm not worried about anything. And sport mode moves quick. So just to kind of understand this, it's way faster than it was before. So now you can see I'm moving along super quick at this point. Got some RC signal interference, not really sure what that's from, but no big deal, we'll just get a little bit higher, usually that solves it. And you can see as I move around, it's a lot quicker to respond, it's not as smooth anymore, uh, versus if I'm in normal mode, it's much smoother. But this allows me to, again, to go much faster. This can be useful when you wanna get back from somewhere far away after doing a hyperlapse or something like that. So I'm just gonna fly right towards me right here. Again, there is no obstacle avoidance, so just keep that in mind. So like that tree right there, you wanna go ahead and ensure that you're not gonna you hit that tree. In my case, I manually controlled over the top of it. Uh, you will see those uh, obstacle show up on the menu. So you see right there, the red, but it'll fly happily right into that. To get back in normal mode again, just simply toggle back to normal, just like this. And now you're in normal mode. And now if I try, if I go down here on purpose, if I try to fly into this, it's just gonna automatically go up and around it like that. I mean, how cool is that? It just, just works. Now for this last thing, I wanna show you hand catching a drone. I think it's an incredibly useful skill to have and it allows you to get yourself out of the pickle if conditions change. Uh, so you can always go ahead and land using the return to home option or the buttons on there or even just manually flying it to the ground. But there are many scenarios like out in a boat, maybe in deeper snow or in the beach with lots of sand where you don't wanna put the aircraft near the sand where hand catching it is way better for the aircraft's viability and lifelong durability. So to hand fly it, all you do to hand catch it, all you do is go ahead and bring it down somewhere away from you. So in this case, I'm you know two meters away from it. I'm gonna bring it down right here. I prefer to bring it down to roughly head level. Uh, and the reason is that I wanna be able to see what I'm doing. If I bring it down like this, I'm likely gonna hit my hand on the props. In this case, if I'm at head level, it's super easy. Once you got it right there, then walk towards it. Stay about a meter away like this, two meters away. Now, once you have it like this, you're gonna reach under, you're gonna take the drone, hold on to the drone, and simply flip it over, just like that. The moment you flip over a DJI drone, it will turn off. It is as easy as that. Uh, now you can stop a recording if you want to, but again, just by simply reaching up, grabbing the drone from underneath, you won't hit the props, you flip it over like this with your hand, you're done. You can do this for every single one, well not like the Inspire series, but all the DJI consumer drones, you can do this, and this is how I land virtually every single one of my drones, because I find it the safest option for the drone, uh, and honestly on a drone like this, even if you do hit the props with your hand, it's It'll hurt, but it won't, won't cut blood in most cases. So before we shut this off though, I wanna quickly show you downloading some of those photos and videos. So on the right hand side, you've got a little gallery play button right there. Just simply tap that, and it'll load up all the stuff that's on your drone. I've got a bunch of stuff here. You can scroll down to find what you want. So here's the day that I shot this tutorial. You'll see that each one of these clips has a slightly different icon on it. So these top three there, the top left hand side are video clips. Then there's some quick shots. There's a master shots up to the left there, up to the right, sorry. Uh, you can see there's the pano, there's photos in here. Uh, so if I open up this 48 megapixel photo right there, I can then choose to download it by tapping that lower right hand button. Then my option then is to download to the phone album or download to the DJI app album. I'll choose my phone album. And in the lower right hand corner, you can see the progress bar. It's almost done and it's done. It's as quick as that. And I can do the exact same thing for a video. Uh, here is a 17 second video. This is a vertical video in this case. So you can see then I can play it right now if I wanted to, um, or I can just simply download, not a lot of action in this video, but that's fine. 
and I can download it and choose the phone album or the app album. In this case, it's using the controller to download it from the drone. You can also use the Wi-Fi direct option between your phone and the drone. If I go and unplug the controller, you'll see the icon in the right-hand corner there, and I can go ahead and refresh that and find the aircraft nearby and then download that way instead. This way is a whole lot faster to download things and does not require the controller be powered on, just your phone and the drone. Okay, hopefully you found this video interesting or useful. Uh, if so, definitely drop a comment down at the bottom. There's another area that you want me to cover. I'm happy to do that or press the like button. It really does help out this video and the channel quite a bit and I, I really appreciate it. Again, consider subscribing. I got plenty more kind of cool things to cover on this, all sorts of nuances and, and fun areas that I just like exploring. Oops, and apparently does this does too. Anyways, have a good one.